Hello, everyone, and welcome to St. Matthew's Angley Church. I am the priest here, Reverend Philip Stonhouse, and I hope you've had a good weekend, long break, uh, sunny, warm days. That you've been getting outside, enjoying it all. I know I missed yesterday because it was a vacation, but I just wanted to take a quick moment now to continue on our series about um, our service, our worship together, and why each piece is so important and why we do what we do. You might remember last week that we talked about the Psalms, how the Psalms are a central way in which God teaches us how to pray. The Psalms as a place where generations have prayed in poetic ways to express their lamentation, their suffering, their hopes, their dreams, their joys, their worship. And that is a way in which God invites us to do the same. And so within all of it, within the hardest points, we have an understanding that that's what we should lift up to God. You know, the worst fears, the worst anger, the greatest joys, all of that we should give to God and trust him with it because he is our greatest joy and he will bring justice to our greatest anger. His wrath, we should always leave space for his wrath. Today now we are moving from the Old Testament and the Psalms into the New Testament. So normally in a service there is three readings and a Psalm. The Old Testament reading, usually, sometimes there's a bit New Testament in that first reading, a Psalm, and then generally is an epistle. Sometimes that second reading is an epistle or a reading from Acts or a reading from Revelation. And this section is really important and it's different than the Gospels because what we find in these, in the second reading, is the disciples trying to live out their faith and trying to lift up one another in faith. So whichever book it is, it functions a little different each time. Um, so let's say it's a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. What we find in this, this book is uh, the gospel writer Luke now trying to write out a historical um, account of what the disciples did after Jesus. So Jesus had ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit, and now this is the disciples trying to live out their faith. And now it is a historical understanding of how the Holy Spirit is moving through them as a community to build up the church. And so we see this happen. The whole story is a playing this out. You know, at Pentecost, they were scared and then the Holy Spirit moves into them and moves them out with power, with voice, with representation. And then what we find is there's the persecution of the church. And what happens is that now the church is pushed out and moves into the world because now it's no longer just centered in Jerusalem, but it moves out into all of these different cities throughout. And then we find the Holy Spirit moving in people like Saul, who becomes Paul, who we'll hear about in a second, who then becomes one of these great teachers in the church, even though before that he was a persecutor because the Holy Spirit moves in them in incredible ways. And then we see continuously the hearts changed of the disciples of Peter, as he is moved to welcome the Gentiles, which is anyone that's not Jewish, um, which is a huge population of them. And again, we find the same thing working out through the letters. Um, what we find is the disciples continually being urged by the Holy Spirit. Philip chasing after the Ethiopian unit. Paul uh, going to the disciples and trying to figure out what does it mean to be both a Gentile and a Jewish church? And the disciples wrestling with this and figuring out, okay, what are the things that all people need to follow? You know, no sacrifice of blood sexual immorality, all of this stuff that they're really wrestling with together, that we need to do together. It's really actually cool stuff of seeing the church wrestle and grow together with the Holy Spirit. And I love the book and I should spend more time in it. 
Then after that, you find a series of letters. It starts with uh, the order of the letters starts with Paul and starts with the longest to the shortest of his letters. And so there's kind of a mixed um, bag there. It starts with Romans, which is this long letter of, the, of Paul writing to the Roman church. The Roman church is one of the biggest churches at this time. Um, also, I should say the letters do not follow a historical um, chronolo chronology. You can look that up if you want, find it online. Um, not all of it is definitive because they're trying to find clues in the letters, but uh, it gives a good representation because uh, Paul often gives clues. You know, if he's in jail, if he's already visited once or twice, X, Y, and Z, and Acts gives us a sense of Paul's trajectory of movement. But Romans is his letter to the Church of Rome. This is right after um, the Romans, uh, Caesar at the time, kicking out um, the Jewish people. Because, well, a lot of people, the Jewish Christians, because a lot of uh, leaders throughout the Christian movement found Christians actually a destabilizer because they challenged the prop, the normal way of, of faith. They had a way of sort of overturning it. Um, you know, they had a way of challenging the military system, of, of challenging the religious system, um, and of, of bringing about a new kind of way. And so consistently rulers were challenged by them. And so th this letter is now to a Jewish Gentile church that is coming back together after years of separation. And now they're finding, so at this point, the Gentile church has um, sort of the authority in the Roman church because they've been there longer, they know it better. They know the space, they have a larger population, which is wholly different than a lot of other churches because they're Jewish based. But now the Jewish people are coming back in and they're trying to find this balance between living a kosher life, living a life based on the law of the Old Testament and living this new sort of Gentile way and trying to find this balance of how do we live together when one of us is upholding the law of the Old Testament, um, which often falls in uh, eating ceremonies and what can we eat, what can't we eat, um, what do we know in Jesus and uh, genealogies with you, um, Abraham, X, Y, and Z. And then what does it mean to be living out anew where there is no Jew or Gentile? That all things come through faith, not through acts. Acts are still important, it doesn't say that, but what does it mean to live together? And I think this is immensely practical. Okay, it happens in a different time, but the really cool thing is that you can see what Paul is doing as he writes them. What is he teaching them and how is he wrestling with scripture and who Jesus is so that they can find a way together? And I think this message for us, as especially in Canada, but across the world, as we become a church that is multicultural, multinational, multi-ethical, ethnical, um, multi sort of theological, um, which is what they're doing too. They're wrestling with theology. You know, we in the Anglican Church are a liberal, conservative, high, low, evangelical, um, mainstream church. All of this in all, and trying to live together in this weird cacophony of, of multitude. And so learning how they wrestled with it then can help us wrestle with it now. And understand how do we make room for one another? How do we... Uh, lift up one another in our weaknesses and our strengths. There are so many things happening in so many letters. Uh, the Corinthians who um, are wrestling with how to be a loving community when, uh, you know, there's rich people that 
just want to uh, have their fill and not caring for the less wealthy in the church, um, which gives Paul immense vision to talk about, you know, love. <laughs> and we get that beautiful uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love is gracious. Love does not, uh, love forgives, but does not hold on to um, wrongs. It's such, such a beautiful things come out of this and really practical things that have so much meaning to us. Um, we hear things like um, stuff that we hold on to in, in funerals that I truly believe that neither life nor death nor principalities nor heaven nor hell nor anything can separate us from the love of God. In God, we are more than conquerors. All of this stuff is wrestling with theology and with God to help us to live together and have this hope through a hard world. So much of the letters is, you know, Paul in prison, uh, the disciples now, these churches being persecuted and them wrestling with the real difficulty that it is in a broken world to be Christian. So many beautiful things. Um, there is the books of Timothy, which is Paul writing to a new leader in the church, Timothy, um, who is young and trying to figure out what does it mean to be a leader in the church. And Paul is trying to help him understand how to order the church, how to invite new leaders, how to lift up new leaders, and how to hold on to courage. There's the letter of Philemon, which is Paul's letter to this wealthy man named Philemon, who, and Paul is trying to get Philemon to welcome back this Christian, who, I think it's Onesimus, um, who is, uh, who was one of Philemon's slaves, but is now free. And what Paul is trying to do is lift up this, this man to become a brother rather than a slave, to become a fellow worker in Christ. And there's this beautiful way in which Paul says, you know how much I have given you, how much hope you have found in Jesus and how much you owe me. So use that account to pay off any debts this other man has. And now welcome him as your brother. And that is a more, uh, that is a beautiful gift that Jesus is giving to you. It's a beautiful, short, very short letter. There's the letter of Hebrews that we don't know um, who wrote it, that um, is wrestling with scripture and is helping Jewish people understand that scripture actually points the way towards Jesus and is helping these Jewish Christians now understand, you know, why do things look different because of Jew Jesus? A lot of it wrestles with, you know, the priesthood, why the temple worship, and how Jesus has um, overthrown the Levitical line, not overthrown, but has changed it, um, because he is a better priesthood. They use the order of Melchizedek. He talks about why we don't need sacrifices anymore, because Jesus was the holy and sufficient sacrifice. Why he changed the lower order of Adam, because he is the son of God. He is the son of God, the new order of the son of God. Amazing and beautiful things. Um, that after the letters of Paul, then it goes to the longest order letters again. And we get a series of different disciples writing. So we get the letters of John, the letters of Peter. Um, I feel like I'm missing one. I can't remember offhand, but um, just some amazing, amazing stuff. And we really should look at all of it because it's just continually working out. Oh, James is the one I was trying to remember. Um, first and second Peter, first, second and third John. Um, is that then Revelations? Oh, Jude, yes, Jude, right. Um, just 
continuously people trying to wrestle with what does it mean now to be a community of faith and to be a leader in this church. And you can learn so much from the way they do it. One important thing to note about the letters, the epistles, so that's all everything from Romans to Jude, is that these are letters. So you think about how you write a letter, um, letters to particular churches or people. And so they always come and come with a relationship. So Romans is a weird example because Romans is Paul writing to a church he's never met. But most of them come with a particular relationship and with a particular purpose. And you could find that just by reading the, what the purpose is because they, the, the writers address it continuously. And so we should take that into account and also take into account that these letters are addressing not only a particular relationship, but a particular situation. And so that can actually help us understand why Paul is saying such things. You know, there's a lot of Paul I wrestle with um, because it's, you know, not completely what I think God is pointing us to in the, within the rest of scripture. So we should always balance the two, wrestle with, if you feel like there's a hypocrisy, bring the two into account and let them wrestle because usually we'll find even more through it. You know, there's, um, there's one thing I wrestle with in scripture and I don't have all the answers here. So, um, which is a moment Paul says that um, women shouldn't teach men which is very ironic because at other moments he talks about um, praying for this one woman who leads a church in her house, which is amazing. Um, and so there's this weird like difference, like why would Paul say two different things? Um, which that's when you bring in the context. And so what you find within that context is in that letter, Paul is talking about um, the, this group of women that is, are becoming um, gossipers, that are actually leading people away from God and they're talking behind people's backs and they're changing um, words and, and putting disorder within the church. And so in that moment, they, uh, the church, when Paul isn't around and he can't, you know, uh, he can't be there right beside people. He's just saying, this is what you need to do right now, which is a hard line to draw in the sand, but he's not doing that. You know, in most of his letters, he's saying, I'm hoping to visit you soon. And it's just like sometimes in the church, you know, we might be called to some hard things. We might be called to say, um, you know, you can't lead this group because of something you've done. It's, you know, part of what it means to be a good leader sometimes is to say you're not leading well. And so at this time, you have to be a follower. Um, and the letters continuously do that kind of stuff. Um, we'll get to a reading on that first. Uh, but first, I just want to talk to you about Revelations quick, which Revelations is, is a really beautiful and well thought out and amazingly wise book. It, it falls within the genre of the prophets of old and the apocalyptic revelations from God earlier on. Um, oh, the, coming just from the title, the revelation, uh, it's a really, the revelation from Jesus Christ is the very first line. Um, it tells you what it is. It's all about revelation, about vision, about seeing, and uh, new ideas, um, or a new confirmation. And what happens within this letter is it becomes this huge compiling, this huge layering of everything throughout scripture up to this point. And you'll find tons of, of metaphor and and analogies that are just pointing to all of this stuff that happened in the past, that happened throughout the rest of scripture. 
And to really understand Revelations, you need to read it a lot, but then you also need to read the rest of scripture, which is true for all of scripture. Just read it a lot. Um, but there is so many beautiful things happening here. It, you know, it, there's uh, John writing letters to the church through this angel, through their angels, um, you know, to the church of Ephesus, to the church of Smyrna. And then he gets these visions as he's lifted up in the heaven of, of God's revelation and his um, outpouring of justice into the world. And there's some terrifying things, but there's some amazing and beautiful things that happen throughout. So I just wanted to quickly look at one part to just see what kind of the wrestling might look like. Um, this might not be the best example, but it was one I was reading this morning. So, so this is Hebrews 5, 11, and then into 6. Uh, let's go up to um, 10. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And God permitted, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in holy, the Holy Spirit, who've tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To the Lord of loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often fall, falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those from whom it is farming receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. The word of the Lord. And so one of the things you could just read here from reading that is that Paul is talking to people that are forgetting the very foundations of our faith. They're these Hebrew people um, are forgetting what it means to really love and take care of their neighbors, of, are forgetting what it means to find salvation through faith. They're forgetting what repentance is, of what salvation and eternal life. You can hear it just within that. But what Paul wants to do with all people is to help them to continually grow in faith so that they might rest in the foundations, in the hope of eternal life, in repentance, but then grow into more. And he uses these analogies of, you know, being infants that only drink of the milk. You know, that's, that's good and important for a time to drink of the milk and to grow strong. But at a point we grow more mature, wiser and stronger. And so we eat other things. You know, that's the analogy he's using. We become more like adults. That happens through time, but we grow into it. And if we go back to trying to be infants, well, it kind of puts us to shame. We see that a lot in the world, people acting like children. Don't need to get into that. But that's what Paul's talking about. 
Um, but, and he's talking about that sometimes when we become like this, what we actually do is put shame on Jesus. Um, if we're continually in need of that same kind of repentance and we're not growing and changing and, and conforming to Jesus, then we're just becoming like children again in need of that milk to Jesus' disgrace. Or we are becoming like thorns and thistles, which aren't receiving God's blessings because we're choking out the good. And we're not bearing fruit. But like all of us, you know, we, we sometimes fall into this and Paul is urging them and us to move forward. To find and be changed and to rest in those foundations of faith. And Paul sees in them immense hope, even with all of this harsh talk, which is always what we must remember. You know, sometimes in sermons, I go back to foundations because we need those foundations. We need to be reminded. We need to keep repenting and being changed and growing in faith. But he has a hope for them, just as I have a hope for me and for all of us, that God is holding on to the good works we are trying to do. And he is making us more and more fruitful. Sometimes that happens, that takes pruning, you know, as, as the dead or stuff is being cut away, whatever it might be. Um, and sometimes that hurts. But God is making us more and more fruitful. He's intending us to be this community of faith that is edifying one another, that is lifting up to become more and more like his church. There's this continuous growth that is meant to happen in faith. And these letters are all about that, that grounding and that building and that growing and that becoming fruitful. And these kind of words are continuously used, these visions, these metaphors um, that you'll find throughout scripture. I have talked a lot more than I planned, but there is so much good in these letters, and I just really wanted to pour over them so that whenever you have a chance to enter into one of these letters, these revelations, these acts, that you'll have a better understanding of what is happening in these moments and the amazing, beautiful reality in which it is to be Christ's chosen wrestling with what it means to be his body in this world, to be his community, to be his love. I hope that as you read them, as you wrestle with them, that you will grow in faith and in love and in a practical faith that is God's love lived out in this world. Let's just take a moment to pray. Lord God, we thank you that there have been so many people that have gone before us and have done this work of wrestling with faith in, every, in so many contexts. Help us to see that wrestling and then to see how it might apply in our everyday life. Give us eyes to see, ears to understand, and hearts to move that we might be the workers of your love in this world, a community of diversity that breaks down boundaries so that we might love together, might offer a different kind of world than this world professes. We pray this all in your name. Amen. God bless you, everyone, and I hope you have been enjoying your uh, lovely sun these last few days and the blessings of God that pour out. Uh, may God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and grant you peace. God bless you, everyone. Bye.